Electric cars are becoming more and more common. If you live in a major city, they're everywhere, especially those iPads on wheels from chief twit Elon Musk. And they've got a lot going for them. Imagine never having to visit a gas station or anything resembling one, except when you go on a road trip. With an electric car, you just walk out of your house in the morning, unplug, and you've got a full tank. If you drive your car approximately 11,000 miles a year, the average miles traveled per vehicle in the US, according to the latest available numbers from 2021, or about 30 miles per day, you probably don't even have to charge more than a few times a week. And if you've got solar panels on your house, you can feel all warm and snugly that you're charging your car with clean energy. It sounds awesome, but here's the thing. Plenty of people don't live in houses where they can put in a 240 volt charging station, otherwise known as a level two EVSE, the kind that would charge your car overnight. Without home charging, your ownership experience and costs are likely gonna be a lot worse. Also, averages hide a lot. Depending on where you live, you could drive a whole lot more. People who live in Wyoming average more than 20,000 miles a year, double what someone from Washington State does. Now, I wanna pause here and give a brief note on statistics. I'm using data from the US Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration and basing my calculations on the annual number of miles driven per vehicle, not the number of miles driven per person. I found conflicting information. Some reports peg the average number of miles driven per person as being around 13,500 per year, but I've got to assume that estimate includes people driving multiple vehicles, and I couldn't find information to verify if that number was even current. Whether the average American drives 30 miles a day or 37 though, most of the conclusions I talk about here should hold true. Anyway, part of the point is there's no black and white answer for whether an EV makes sense, even on a surface level. You gotta look at how you drive, how much you drive, and where you live to figure it out. And when you dive below the surface, things get even murkier. Like, EVs are so much cheaper to own than regular cars. All right, let's talk about cost. EVs are expensive, costing about $10,000 more to buy than a comparable internal combustion engine car. In the US, the only thing that brings the purchase price closer to parity is government incentives and tax rebates. Of course, if you live somewhere like Norwegia, where tax policies make gasoline cars much more expensive than EVs, that's a whole other story. But no matter how you slice it, they're expensive, probably even more than that $10,000 figure given the various government subsidies and support offered to EV manufacturers along the way. That's a bill that eventually falls back on the public, so keep that in mind. Right now, the thing that makes EVs so much more expensive seems to be their large, complex, heavy batteries, which account for around 40% of the cost of an EV. People promoting electric vehicles often say that battery prices will fall with mass production and economies of scale. The problem is that isn't what's really happened so far. Instead, it's kind of the opposite. With more and more manufacturers fighting over limited supplies of lithium, nickel, and cobalt, prices for those commodities have taken a roller coaster ride these past few years. They've all come back down recently, but it's helpful to remember that no matter how efficient the production process becomes, a lot of the price of the finished battery is the raw material cost. The real place EV advocates say they shine is in cost of ownership, and in some ways they have a point. At the US average electric rate of 15 cents per kilowatt hour as I write this, driving something like a Tesla Model 3 100 miles would cost you around $3.75. Driving a gas-powered Toyota Camry V6 that same distance would cost you more than three times as much at the nationwide average of a little over $3 a gallon. Live in a state like California where gas averages more than $4.50 a gallon, or Washington, where electricity averages around 10 cents a kilowatt hour, and those numbers might be even more attractive. Though then again, in the case of California, electricity is expensive too, whatever. The point is, EVs probably cost less to fuel than gas cars do. Since EVs cost more to purchase up front, but might have lower running costs over time, one way to account for that is to consider the total cost of ownership over the first five years. Assuming you even keep your car that long, and that's a big assumption. Of course, fuel isn't the only cost you've gotta consider. There's also maintenance, insurance, and depreciation, among other things. EV advocates point to the relative simplicity, theoretically, of electric car powertrains as a major bonus in that maintenance department, but apart from the lack of an engine and conventional transmission that need oil and fluid changes, EVs and combustion engine cars have a lot of similar maintenance needs. No matter what, tires are gonna wear out, wiper blades are gonna need changing, and depending on how you drive, you might even need a set of brake pads. Still. EVs have a slight edge in the maintenance department, saving owners around $300 in maintenance costs over the first five years. It's somewhat the same story with financing, insurance, and depreciation, though in all three cases, EVs are more costly than gas cars. In a way, that makes sense. They're more costly to begin with, so it's reasonable to assume they'll cost more to finance and insure, and with higher price tags, they've got more ground to give up to depreciation. 
Also, the pace of innovation is so quick in the EV space that a model a few years old could easily seem outdated when newer models have drastically improved range or other advancements, and that's going to impact depreciation as well. In fact, depreciation is what really erases the cost-benefit of EVs at the moment. Lower maintenance and fuel costs more than make up for the higher insurance and financing costs of EV ownership, but depreciation erases that savings and more. An analysis by the National Automobile Dealers Association using Kelly Blue Book data showed that EVs cost consumers an average of $65,000, while gas cars average closer to $57,000 over the first five years of ownership, with a good portion of that difference attributed to depreciation. And look, depreciation is the silent killer of the car industry. Even industry insiders like captive in-house financing companies at the manufacturers themselves, the people who should have the most accurate pricing information of anyone, get it wrong. There was a time not that long ago that you could walk into a BMW dealer and buy a lease return three-year-old 7 Series, a car that sold for 80 grand new for under $30,000 certified pre-owned. Depreciation happens. And just because average EV depreciation is high today doesn't mean that'll be the case forever. In fact, it's probably the opposite. Luxury cars have pretty much always posted high depreciation numbers, and a lot of EVs so far have been in similar price categories. With lower priced EVs on the horizon, depreciation averages could easily improve soon. Beyond the five-year mark, things get murky. EVs seem to generally need fewer repairs as they age, but the repairs they do need often end up costing more. Honestly, we're pretty good at making gas engines, and as complex as they are, pretty much any gas engine car you buy today should easily surpass 100,000 miles without needing major repair. It's more of a question mark when it comes to EVs. Will the battery last 8 to 10 years? How much will the range have decreased by then? Sure, Tesla has data to show that their batteries only lose about 12% of capacity over 200,000 miles of driving, but they're also quick to note that age, regardless of mileage, is another major factor in battery capacity retention, and that newer battery chemistries might perform differently. Historically, heat has been a major killer of batteries. Will your EV last as long in Las Vegas as it does in Chicago? It's still pretty pricey to swap a battery now. How much less will it be in a few years? Yes, there's a German guy who's driven a Tesla Model S over a million miles, but he needed 13 rear motor swaps and three batteries to do it. As commenters have been quick to point out, that 10-year-old Model S bears little resemblance to today's EVs. The pace of innovation and discovery means we're frequently in uncharted waters, so who's to say how today's technologies will age? Look, dude, even if it costs a little more, it's the right thing to do for the planet. Fair enough. I'm all about doing the right thing. So how much greener is driving an EV than driving a gas car? Spoiler alert, it depends. Maybe I should have titled this video, eh. One good way to do this is to consider the carbon footprint of various options. Carbon footprint is only one of the concerns with the EV manufacturer. The other big one is the intensive use of metals like lithium, nickel, aluminum, and cobalt, things that have to be mined from the earth, often in countries that don't have stellar environmental track records. I'm certainly not saying petroleum drilling and manufacturing is any cleaner, but in some ways it seems like we're swapping one dirty practice for another. Since assessing the relative crappiness of two natural resource extraction methods is outside the scope of this video, I'm just going to look at carbon footprint. One thing we can agree on is making a new EV has a higher carbon footprint than making an equivalent gas car. But over the car's life cycle, depending on the method of generation used to supply the electricity, that debt can quickly get paid off. Notice the qualifier there. Plenty of not Tesla brands make identical versions of internal combustion and electric powered models. Former Swedish swan diving champion Volvo offers an excellent comparison. They make the XC40 and its twin the XC40 Recharge and have done us the favor of calculating the break-even point between the siblings. With the current global electricity generation mix, the EV version breaks even at 146,000 kilometers, or a little under 91,000 miles. In some ways, that's a worst case scenario since the grid is slowly getting cleaner, but given that about 60% of our electricity in the US is currently generated using methods that produce greenhouse gases, it's probably not too far off. One other thing I found in the report, Volvo figures the car's life is just 200,000 kilometers, or a little under 125,000 miles. So not long after you break even, you might be looking to get a new car. Tesla paints a rosier picture than Volvo does in their environmental impact report. For a US-made vehicle, Tesla figures a comparable internal combustion engine car would produce almost three times as much CO2 over a 200,000 mile life cycle as a Model 3 or Model Y does. Interestingly, cars made at their Chinese factory have a much higher carbon footprint. If you know why that is, let me know. I didn't get a chance to research it. The dirty way we generate electricity right now is a big part of the problem. 
Many current EV owners are early adopters, people with higher incomes who might be able to afford the high upfront costs to put solar panels on their roofs. And if they've got a big enough solar panel system, they might be charging their EV with clean energy. If you live in an apartment, on the other hand, the only thing you can control is what time of the day you charge your EV. Charge overnight when you'd most likely want to during off-peak hours to save money, and you'd probably be using dirtier energy to do it. Charge during peak times when the sun is shining and maybe some, but maybe not many, of your electrons will come from cleaner sources. Check your utility's power content label to find out. And yet again, here we are with a big, maybe they're good? It really depends on what vehicle you buy, how long you keep it. For it to lower your own personal carbon footprint, you might need to keep it for eight years or more. How you charge it, where you live, and whether you can put in a charging station at home, and your personal tolerance for hassle during longer trips. Even that experience is likely to improve as more infrastructure gets built and we figure out better ways to handle public charging. So, I don't know. I got stuck with an EV as a rental car on a recent business trip, and let's just say it was a bit of a bumpy ride. All the pluses that make them good cars to own for the right people are gone when that car becomes a rental, and I was left with just the minuses. Maybe that's one of the reasons Hertz is pulling back on its EV fleet. I gotta say, popping by the gas station for a few minutes on my way to the airport would have been a lot more convenient than sitting in a random hotel parking lot for an hour wondering why the fast charger that claimed an 80 amp charging capacity and a car that boasted its ability to charge at up to 100 amps never managed to charge rate higher than 40 amps for more than a few minutes, but maybe they'll fix that too eventually. Knowing and understanding everything I just talked about, would I buy one? Maybe, probably eventually, but not until my current vehicle wears out. And since it's a 13-year-old Ford Ranger, that's probably gonna be a while. I think they're still cool. And the idea of skipping the pump and feeling like I'm doing better for the planet, even if it's not as much as I'd like yet, that's interesting too. But I won't be deluding myself thinking I'm light years ahead of those gas-guzzling normies with their dinosaur burners. For now, I'll just be slightly better, maybe. What do you think? Are EVs a scam? How long will it take for the balance to shift? Let me know in the comments, and until next time, we don't have a problem, we've got an opportunity.